I'd like to introduce myself, uh, Brian Janeway, First Miami Church. I have a co-host today, my cousin, Jeff Howell, who is managing the tech, so I don't have to think about it while I uh, rattle on. <laughs> so thank you to him. Uh, we're here for the uh, part four now of the uh, First Miami Archaeology Discipleship Group, which uh, has been taking us through uh, the Bible, archaeologically speaking, in a more or less chronological fashion. Uh, from the beginning, uh, we started with uh, an introduction to biblical archaeology and how we do archaeology and how we know what we know so that you can better understand all of the material that I present as we go forward. So we talked about the uh, introduction to archaeology. We went into the origins of biblical Israel and talked about Egypt and some of those Egyptian origins and the earliest evidence we have of Israelites. Uh, and then the first mention of Israel as we moved into the book of Judges in Merneptah and some of the uh, fascinating information with Mount Ebal, the migration of the Danites, the emergence of Israelites in large settlement surveys in the hill country, which became their core uh, land uh, from which they expanded down to the coast and north and south as well. And when they started clashing, of course, with the people in the land and when they were commanded to go in and conquer the land and take it from the Canaanites and a number of other named peoples, uh, which they did not fully do. And then we find them engaged in conflict with these people for centuries following that, beginning with the judges and moving forward, as well as uh, dissension uh, amongst themselves and fighting amongst the tribes, which were still in those tribal allotments and arrangements organized not as a nation state, but as a, a tribal entities. So now we move into uh, the, uh, a topic which is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, before you start thinking about jokes about Philistines, yes, uh, I have been called a Philistine before. And uh, so I, I'll, I'll cop to that. Uh, but um, the Philistines became a subject of uh, my interest uh, when I started back into grad school. And when I began to look for a topic to do a dissertation on. And we'll be looking at some of that later in the, in the uh, program here. Uh, what I'm trying to do is consolidate about a three-hour lecture into 40 minutes. So we've got a lot of slides to cover, about 70, but some of them won't take very long. But I want to give you the adequate uh, amount of breadth and uh, adequate depth without going too deep and getting too detailed and getting bogged down. So we'll start with uh, this famous quote from uh, little David before he was king. Uh, when he was uh, mustering against the Philistine army. And this little guy comes up and says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? So we're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath, as well as Samson and Delilah. These are probably the two most famous stories of individual peoples uh, that are clashing with Philistines and such. Of course, with David, he goes one-on-one uh, -on -one against Goliath and slays him with a sling. And uh, the uh, Goliath Philistine, uh, the Philistine uh, Goliath is said to have come from Gath, G-A-T-H, the city of Gath, which is only even recently identified in the archaeological record. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. His armament, that is Goliath's armament, is described. He has a helmet. He has a, a, a large spear like a weaver's beam. It was so large because he was such a large man, uh, a shield. And he also had something called greaves, which are like shin guards that were worn by uh, warriors of the time, but not from that area, actually from the area of ancient Greece during the time of uh, the Trojan War and such. And this is the same time period we're talking about here. This is the 12th century BC. So let's move on. Uh, we have David's challenge to Goliath. And here's a little schematic there of David getting to sling his stone, which of course he was successful in slaying Goliath. And then separating his head from his torso and parading it around as a war trophy. Not uncommon in ancient times. So the story of David and Goliath, probably the most famous uh, of the Philistine stories. Now, when you go to the dictionary, this is kind of funny, uh, and you look up Philistine, you find that it's defined like this, a person who is hostile or indifferent to culture and the arts or who has no understanding of them. So sort of an uncultured brute. Uh, Example would be, would be, I am a complete Philistine when it comes to paintings or fill in the blank. 
Uh, when we started to excavate and when excavators started to excavate actual Philistine cities, what they found was something quite different. At least in terms of material culture, the Philistines were more advanced, it appears, and had a uh, finer, more sophisticated urban culture than the Israelites of the time did. So the Philistines, when they showed up, were along the coastal plain, what we called Philistia. And in that hill country uh, area where I first showed you where Israel shows up, they were sort of like the country bumpkins, the hillbillies, if you will. And when we look at their pottery in particular, their pottery is very ordinary and very unimpressive. But when you look at the Philistine pottery, you see something quite different. It's very colorful. It has unique shapes and forms. It's much better made and it has a much more artistic merit. So when we look at who really are the Philistines, it seems like the Israelites were like the real Philistines. But of course, this is just a modern adaptation of the word Philistine from the Bible. And when they speak of the uh, Philistines as being uncircumcised and sort of brutish, they're really speaking more in spiritual terms as the enemies of ancient Israel, not in terms of their urbane culture or sophistication otherwise. So that is the modern definition of a Philistine. But as you know, that is not, not true in the actual uh, history. Now, a little map here that shows the five, this is called the Philistine Pentapolis oftentimes. There are five major cities of the Philistines, and they've almost all been excavated except for Gaza in the south. Now, you may have heard there's a lot of conflict lately, just in the last few days, as rockets are being fired into Israel from Gaza. So this is a Palestinian territory today, and you have the other cities, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. Those are the other four cities, and they've all been excavated. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the, uh, the very site where the battle between David and Goliath took place was a little place, well, not a little place, a place called the Valley of Elah, right here in the center of this slide. And this is the main communication or transportation route from the coastal plain up to Jerusalem, is through this valley. So there are a number of very important sites like Soko, Azekah, and Gath, which are located along this valley. And this is exactly where the conflict between the Philistines and the Israelites took place. This shows you a view of the Elah Valley, a uh, beautiful area, uh, well-watered, it's uh, agricultural, and it still forms uh, the main communication or transportation route up to the hill country, the central hill country. So this is actually a fortress site called Kerbet Kiafa. And this was only recently discovered, well, about 10, 15 years ago, and it's been dated to the time of David. So it uh, is generally acknowledged as a fortress site built by the Israelites, probably even King David himself. And uh, we can imagine where he would place such a fortress in a very strategic location, perhaps even overlooking the very site where he had his initial conflict with Goliath. So that is what you're looking at here, the site of Kerbet Kiafa. Here's an aerial view of the fortress site. It's been excavated. Uh, large portions of it. A lot of it was empty in the middle, but it had buildings surrounding along the walls here to make it a fortification site, and it had a couple of different gates. Uh, the south-facing gate is the one I showed you the picture of previous, so that was the main gate that overlooked the Elah Valley. And they even found some uh, inscriptions here which uh, indicate that these were most likely Israelites living on the site, but it was only a very short-term occupation here. So roughly around uh, 1000 BC, and this is confirmed by uh, radiocarbon dating, uh, was built and occupied for maybe only a generation, and then it was abandoned. So we can very, very closely tie that to the United Monarchy period. We're gonna talk about this more on the next talk when we talk about King David and Solomon, but right around 1000 BC is precisely where we expect to find David and this uh, initial clash with the Philistines. Okay, so now we move back and we take a look at who were these Philistines? Do we have any other indications as to who they were and where did they come from? Now, what you're looking at here is a colored uh, rendition of a large relief that's on a mortuary temple in Egypt, in Thebes, which was the capital city of the New Kingdom uh, during the time of the 12th century. And the uh, pharaoh at this time was Ramses the sec uh, Ramses III. So what this shows is a large battle taking place, both on sea, and you're, you're seeing the, uh, the sea version here, and also taking place on land between 
the armies of Ramses III and a group of uh, what we call a confederation of peoples, perhaps tribal, it would appear so, of peoples that included the Philistines. Now, it's still debated as to where these, uh, this battle took place. It could have taken place uh, along the Levantine coast as far north as Lebanon. Uh, it could have taken place down in the area which is uh, closer towards the borders of ancient Egypt uh, that would be in the, uh, the Sinai along the coast. So it appears that there was, there was definitely a battle that took place. Ramses III puts it on his mortuary temple in grand style, bragging, of course, and boasting about how he conquered these actually uh, invading armies of the sea peoples called collectively people of the sea. That's who the Egyptians call them. And there are several names as well that we'll get to in just a second. When we look at the Philistine material culture, after the excavations at the Philistine sites uh, that I named earlier, they found a number of interesting, um, unique aspects of the Philistine culture, which are sort of, uh, I wouldn't say a laundry list because nothing is perfectly correlated exactly to one culture or the other, but it seems mainly in the form of pottery, we have evidence of a unique Philistine kind of pottery, monochrome, which means one color, and then a later phase using two colors. I'll speak about that briefly in a minute. There's a textile industry in evidence that, sh that uses particular kinds of unbaked clay loom weights or spool weights. There are certain architectural traditions that seem to be revolved around a hearth for fires. There's a culinary preference for pork and a certain style of cooking pots called Aegean style cooking pots. And these have a, a certain shape that uh, are unique to uh, certain sea peoples, it seems. Uh, also, uh, there are certain uh, mixing of uh, water and wine, which was an ancient tradition amongst the Greeks. Uh, so they, there was a, a wine drinking culture using these certain kinds of vessels. Also, they had a, a preponderance of female figurine, uh, what appear to be deity figures also found in the excavations. And there's epigraphic data that is inscriptional data, which uh, indicates certain languages are being spoken of here. Uh, spoken in certain inscriptions that we find in the area of Philistia and in the north. I'll get to that later as well. So in general, the chronology we're looking at is, we call it Iron 1A, that's 1200 to 1150. I won't go into too many details here, but we're, we're moving from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, where the predominant metal used in weaponry and in tools is moving from bronze to iron. So that's a general category of, of dividing up the time periods. So specifically, we're talking about the 12th century here with the arrival of these Philistine peoples, because in the uh, arrangement of pharaohs, if we move down here to Ramses III, in approximately his eighth year, according to his to the records, was when the battle took place with the sea peoples. So we're talking about around roughly 1175 BC or so. And here is a description that accompanies the battle release. And uh, forgive me as I read a little bit here. Uh, a, lo a longer inscription. It says the foreign countries, that is the sea peoples, made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms from Hattai, Kode, Karkamish, Arzawa, Alashia on being cut off or destroyed at one time. A camp was set up in Amuru, which is in the area of Lebanon, Syria, along the coast. They desolated its people and its land was like that which was never come into being. They were coming forward toward Egypt while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Peleset, the Philistines, Cheker, Shekelesh, Denyan, and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the land as far as the circuit of the earth. Their hearts confident and trusting, our plans will succeed. So this is in the words of Pharaoh Ramses III as he describes this this vast uh, onslaught of these uh, armies coming across the land and uh, conquering peoples far and wide, and making their way to Egypt to take on ancient Egypt. You might want to let some of us in the waiting room. There's several ways in the waiting room. Oh, can. okay. Can you text Jeff and ask him to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Sorry, folks. I realize some people haven't been brought in from the waiting room, so I'll just continue on. So, um, I'll move on from here and show you a line drawing of the, um, the battle. And there's a lot of detail here. 
But suffice it to say that different peoples are depicted in different ways with unique different kinds of weaponry and helmets and such on this battle relief. And scholars have for decades tried to, um, to um, get pre precise sort of depictions of these different peoples and find them elsewhere. Here's a blow up of uh, some of these warriors. Now I'll note here, the sort of feathered uh, headdress or helmet that these warriors are wearing. And this is what it looks like today. It's a little bit harder to make out things. We can see uh, here's a warrior that's falling. And this is in one of the boats. This is part of the, the sea battle taking place. And this uh, has often been equated to a Philistine. Actually, on the reliefs and in the inscriptions, there's only one person that's actually identified specifically as a Philistine. He happens to be a chieftain, and he's not. he doesn't wear this headdress. Now, it doesn't mean that this headdress wasn't worn by Philistine warriors, but uh, the only one that we specifically know was uh, indicated as a chieftain here, Denian and Peliset captives. So they could be here because they're not identified individually. Then you have one of the warriors up here on the left. This, this individual here that's kneeling down has sort of a cap is identified as a Peliset chief. So that's the only specific uh, identification we have of a Philistine. And then on the upper right, we have another chief and lower right, Shardana chief. So uh, looking back at the map now, we have the Eastern Mediterranean. Down here in the red box is the area of the Philistines and the Philistine Pentapolis indicated uh, in the inset here with Ashdod, Ekron, Gath, with a question mark, no longer a question mark, Ashkelon and Gaza. All of those cities have been excavated except for Gaza, which is underneath a modern city of Gaza. Now, here you see a map that shows the area of Philistia, which is where they first settled. So apparently, after they were defeated by the uh, Egyptians, they settled or were settled by Ramses III in this area along the coast we call Philistia. And their initial phase of, of uh, settlement is indicated in red. And then they expanded, and it seems that as they expanded into the second generation of their occupation here, they started to make a different kind of pottery, that bichrome pottery I spoke about. So it moved from monochrome pottery to bichrome pottery in the latter part of the 12th century. And then you have here the green country is the central hill country where the Israelites were living at the time. And you can see they're sort of moving towards one another here. And they would be clashing along this frontier, along this area called the Shafela, or the low hills of uh, leading down to the coastal plain. Now to blow it up here to get you a better view of things, right here is the Valley of Elah, Tel Asafi, right here, which is the Arabic name for the site, is now known to be Gath of the Philistines. And that would be just west of the area of Kirby Kiatha, where I showed you earlier, where the battle took place between David and Goliath, right along this line right here that I'm using my cursor to uh, show you. So that's the Philistine expansion of the late 12th century. Now here's a nice picture just of a collection of potsherds that um, are um, just uh, put in a pile. This shows a lot of the painted motifs that appear on this pottery. This is monochrome pottery, so it just has one color painted on it. But you can see all kinds of geometric motifs, this spiral pattern here, this sort of hatch triangle here, uh, another spiral. They also have a propensity to, uh, to draw birds on their pottery, which is interesting. This is an example of a bell-shaped crater, very large bowl, which shows um, a whole line of warriors all the way around it with greaves, you'll notice, down on their legs, along with shields and spears and helmets. Now, this was found at the site of Mycenae, which is in ancient Greece, uh, rough, around about the same time as the Philistines. This all comes into play when we trace the origin of this style of pottery. It takes us back to ancient Greece, the mainland, and the Aegean Islands, and even parts of Western Anatolia or Asia Minor, what is today Turkey. So here's some nice restored vessels, a crater, a small um, uh, bell-shaped bowl here, or skiphos is known in, in the Greek. There's a nice stirrup jar here, the stirrup uh, based on the way the handle comes over the top. There's a little bottle here, a feeding bottle, and another spouted vessel here on the right. You'll notice here there's a bird painted on the side and all kinds of wonderful geometric motifs along on the bowl here. And then the close-up of some of the birds and the patterns and the motifs. So 
Uh, here's examples of a stirrup jar, which was the main jar found uh, in excavations in the Levant that used to come from Greece in export. It appears to have been used for salves or perhaps oils or uh, lotions, uh, oils, uh, fragrant oils, uh, maybe perfumes and such were exported from the area of ancient Greece into the Levant, into the areas of uh, Lebanon, Syria, and, and uh, Israel. And those have been found in excavations in the time leading up to the Iron Age when the Philistines actually show up in the Levant. Here's an example of those loom weights that have been excavated from the sites in Philistia. And a schematic that shows sort of what a, an ancient loom would look like with those uh, loom weights tied off on the threads at the bottom to, to pull them taut so that the loom could work uh, and function properly. Uh, so here are some blowups of what those actual unbaked clay loom weights look like, different sizes, generally the same kind of shape um, used for the, uh, the making of textiles, which seems to be a unique characteristic of the Philistines, as opposed to the uh, local Canaanites who lived in the area. So there's a nice shot of the loom. And I mentioned the uh, female fertility figurines, these seeded uh, figurines. This particular, the, the ones on the left here are, the, uh, are uh, from the uh, Greek mainland. So this is what we call Mycenaean culture, the, air, the uh, city of Mycenae, which was the capital of, um, of ancient, uh, one of the ancient Greek city-states during the time of the Trojan War, where they first started to excavate this culture and this beautiful painted pottery. The figure on the right is called Ashdoda because she was found in the excavations of the Philistine city of Ashdod. So you can see how similar these figurines are which may indicate where they originated from. We know they came from the outside along with those other peoples that are named. Uh, here's a nice shot of Ashdoda again. And we know that she's female because there's some obvious uh, anatomical features of this little figurine, which uh, make uh, no mistake about the uh, sex of the figure. So there's Ashdoda. And this is a nice uh, instance of a cult stand or a, a, an incense burner. So these are found throughout the ancient world and sometimes they're just plain. They have a dish or a bowl on the top where the incense would have been put or perhaps oils of some kind and burned uh, for honoring of the gods and stuff. It has cultic significance. This particular one though shows who could be, uh, we could say uh, a, an Ashdoda. We don't know the name of the deity, but it's certainly female. And in the same fashion as we saw in Ashdoda, the anatomical features of female. And oftentimes you'll see in some of these ancient Canaanite and other female deities, they actually highlight their, uh, their upper torso and oftentimes even uh, use their hands and their arms to further accentuate. So here is a Philistine female deity cult stand. Now, what language, uh, oftentimes we ask the question of where people came from, who were they? And we usually come down on language as being one of the key features of an, of, of an ethnic group. So in this instance, in terms of the Philistines, we have virtually nothing to go on uh, to trace their lineage linguistically. So they show up around about uh, the uh, middle of the 12th century. So we saw the Sea People's Battle taking place about 1175 BC, and that's uh, the same time that we find in the archaeological stratification of those so-called Philistine sites, which were actually Canaanite sites before they were occupied uh, by Philistines, that's when they come in and we see the first evidence of their pottery and their textile industry and their culinary preferences, their Aegean style cooking pots, which are different from the Canaanite cooking pots. These all sort of come in at the same time as we, uh, as, the, as the battle that took place with Ramses III. So after that time, we have centuries of Philistine occupation of these principal sites, but there's virtually no inscriptional or epigraphic data to indicate who they were, what language they were speaking. Uh, we can certainly identify them as Philistines because we know their material culture very well. And of course the Bible describes them uh, in at the clashes over centuries of time from the book of Judges all the way through King David and uh, later kings. And eventually the Philistines were conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and taken off into captivity, like the Israelites were as well. But unlike the Israelites who came back to rebuild their country, the Philistines disappear from history after that. Now we still have remnants of the Philistines in their name 
through the modern name Palestine, which is derived from the Philistines. But there's no ethnic or racial um, commonality uh, between uh, the ancient Philistines and the modern Arab peoples called Palestinians. Nonetheless, the Romans were the first ones to adopt the name Palestine to the area which they were conquering and had conquered Judah of the, Israel, of the uh, ancient Israelites in the time of Jesus. And after they conquered that land, they drove the Jews out of the land into diaspora and they renamed Judah Palestina to try to erase the memory of the Jews. And that name has stuck ever since uh, till this day. So back to the linguistic question of where did the Philistines come from? Uh, the, the only really good inscription that we have that indicates their language comes from many centuries later on this monumental inscription. It's called the Ekron Dedicatory Inscription because it was a dedication to a temple in the city of Ekron. And it says this temple was built by Akish. That is a Greek derived name. Son of Paddy, son of Yasid, son of Ada, son of Yair, ruler of Ekron. For Pitkia, and there's an asterisk there, I'll come back to it. His divine lady, may she bless him and guard him and prolong his days and bless his land. So the two key uh, words here, Akish, a Greek name, and Pitkia, which is still a question mark, but it's believed to be a Greek deity. But it's difficult to identify conclusively. Uh, the important part overall of this inscription is that it's written in a Semitic language, an alphabetic language that's similar to Judahite Hebrew. So by this time, and we're talking centuries later, after they first arrived in the 12th century, they have adopted the local language of the Canaanites and the Israelites. And they're using it here in a royal inscription that was the dedication to a temple to this Greek god or goddess. Uh, in later times. So it appears that over centuries of time, these Philistines settled into the land and started to assimilate the ways of the larger population into which they had moved. So they used to be very unique and their pottery reflected this. It was the monochrome, then it was the bichrome, and then it was a, another derivative of the Philistine pottery kind of a style. And then after about 200 years, their pottery style disappears and it starts to look exactly like the Canaanite pottery and the, the pottery that the Israelites were making at the time. So it shows on a cultural assimilation over centuries of time. Yet we come centuries later here and we find that they're still using some of their Greek derived names and gods and goddesses. So they're still maintaining an ethnic identity, but it's more difficult to pick up in the archeological record and indeed in the inscriptional record as well. So, who were these Philistines and where did they come from? Uh, recently, there have been some DNA studies done on uh, both human remains. They found a, a, a large Philistine uh, cemetery in the uh, city of Ashkelon. And they were able to examine uh, several dozen individuals to try to determine their ethnic origin or their geographic origin. So what they found was that uh, round about the time we expect them to show up in the 12th century or the early Iron Age in uh, archaeological terms, that they, uh, this chart shows all of the examined populations and, and compared uh, populations up here in Anatolia and in Turkey and Greece in the Levant, the Levant being the Eastern Mediterranean area along here, along this uh, coastline. Down here at Ashkelon, a very common uh, characteristics with ancient Greece. And this is the Peloponnese, the uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula of Greece and some of the uh, major city-states of the time uh, that we know of through the Trojan War in Homer, like Pylos, like Mycenae, like Tiryns, are located in this area. And it's, it looks like that these Philistine people have very close connections to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This actual area in the south, southwestern tip would be down near the city of Pylos, which is, according to Homer, where King Nestor was the king of the city-state of Pylos. So this is a fascinating uh, discovery uh, that links the Philistines to the area where we have believed they've been coming all along uh, for many decades. The analysis of this pottery shows that the pottery style uh, originated in this area that I described before. And now we have other corroborating uh, evidence to link them to this area as well. Now they also did analysis of uh, both pig remains and cattle remains. And they found 
that modern boar in the area of Palestine and Israel today bear the same genetic uh, derivation as ancient pigs from Europe. And it appears that that, uh, that first uh, instance of a large group, and these are all the sites that they looked at to examine the animal remains to compare them to those at uh, Tel Es Safi, in this case, Gath, shows that they first came in, you see the red bars here, this is a time period from Middle Bronze Age through to the present. Now the present population of wild boar in Israel looks like, it's unlike all the ancient Near Eastern uh, wild boar in the area, from Turkey to Egypt to uh, Arabia, all the areas that surround Israel have a, uh, a Levantine, if you will, boar. And that's unlike uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the ones of the wild boar in Israel are just like the ones from Europe. And that originated here in the Iron II. So it appears that they brought their pigs uh, from the place from which they came and then brought them with them to uh, ancient Canaan, uh, or which became Philistia. And then that became the predominant wild boar population of modern Israel over time. You see the red bars all the way through this time period. So that's a very strong link also to the initial migration of the Philistines into the Levant, bringing with them, or perhaps over time through trade and uh, commercial relationships, to their pigs from their homeland to their modern homeland or their new homeland. So this is an examination of mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so they also took a look at the cattle and here's some uh, DNA extraction being uh, taking place from uh, bones of these, uh, these ancient animals found. Uh, this is uh, also uh, samples taken of various pigs and cattle uh, all across the region. They found that the cattle did not have a European derivation. So it appears that perhaps because cattle were larger and they were harder to, uh, to bring, to actually transport with them, uh, that they didn't bring their own cattle. So they, they adopted the cattle and use the cattle from the local area, but the pigs came from their homeland. Here's Tiran's, a shot of Tiran's, the homeland of the Mycenaean Greece area, from which we think they may have come. And this is another chart that shows the wild boar in the present, the big red circle here, and the red circle here indicating that uh, this is where they probably came from. You'll notice here the Iron Age, 1150 to 586, is where it first starts showing up in the area of the Levant. See here in the late Bronze Age, no red circles. And then it starts in the Iron Age with these European uh, species of boar. And here's a, a picture of a pig skull, one of the ancient uh, pig mandibles that were used in the analysis. There's a pelvis bone from also from a pig. Uh, one of the key features we find uh, as a contrast between Israelites and ancient Philistine sites is uh, at uh, because of the kosher laws of dietary restrictions on what the Israelites could eat, we don't find almost any pig bones at all. I think I may have mentioned this the last time at ancient Israelite sites. So almost no pig bones. Uh, by contrast, in the Philistine sites, you have lots of pig bones. And they show uh, butcher marks indicating that they were eating uh, the pigs. So certain butcher marks indicate what the ancient peoples were eating. And this is indicated on the bones that we excavate from the sites. And the Philistines had no qualms about eating pork. And that we find that at the Philistine sites. Okay, so now, let me go back to that. I pose to you another group of people, a group of sea peoples, we call these people collectively, that may have settled elsewhere. So we've looked for uh, remnants of these other peoples that are named by Ramses III. And there's not very much to find. Maybe they were smaller groups. Maybe they assimilated very quickly um, to wherever they settled. Maybe they didn't settle at all and they went back home. We really don't know. The Philistines, we have a very strong witness through the biblical uh, text, through the Egyptian records, and through the excavations of the Philistine sites. So when I came upon this subject uh, firsthand some uh, 15 years ago or so, our, uh, the program that I was in started to excavate at a site in eastern Turkey. And at first, I wasn't very excited about digging in Turkey because it wasn't where the Bible was happening. Well, that's kind of what I thought. But really, the Bible is happening in a much larger uh, playing board than just what is considered Israel today. From Egypt to Mesopotamia to Turkey, all of this area are where biblical events were playing out. So it just so happened that up at our site called Tel Tayanat, 
in the Northern Levant. And the inset box here shows the location of this site, which is in Southern Turkey, very close to this border with Syria, right about here where I'm uh, showing my cursor. And that blow up here shows uh, the valley called the Amuk Valley. And it's about 20, 25 miles aside, a roughly triangular shaped valley. And all those little red dots are ancient sites from all different periods of time. It's been occupied since prehistoric times, Neolithic times. It's a, a agricultural area and it's been farmed for millennia. Uh, so this is all of the rich uh, uh, archeological remains that are in the Amuk Valley. So we blow it up a little bit more. We find that our site Tel Tayanat right here is located right on the river, which runs northward takes a turn and moves past the ancient city of Antioch, where they first called them Christians. But of course, when Tainat existed was before Antioch was even founded. So Tainat was the main site and the capital of this whole region occupied in the valley. So when we first started excavating here, we started to find some very interesting things like pottery, which I'll get into in a second. Here's a satellite photo of Tel Tainat located right here. Here's a modern road that runs right along the southern edge of it. And what we found there in 2004, here's a blow up. All these little dots are cores that we ran to find the depth of the uh, archeological deposits and what periods were represented there by bringing up pieces of pottery that we could then date, roughly speaking, and find out where and how deep the remains went. So you have an upper hill here or citadel mound, which is visible to human eye. And then a lower city here, and you can even make out the wall lines here of a city that's at the level, the current level of the fields that are farmed uh, with corn and cotton and things. So you can't even see this part of the city until you start digging down into below the fields. So what we started to find was a pottery that looked very much like Philistine pottery known from the Philistine sites down in Israel. And uh, I started to think, well, wow, this is, um, this is really interesting. This is the same kind of pottery it seems like the Philistines were making, but it doesn't belong up here either because it's not like the local pottery uh, that people were making in this area, both before and during uh, and after the time of the Philistine arrival. So we're, we're looking at pottery that was excavated, excavated from Tel Tainat, and it's a particular bowl style that's known from the Philistine repertoire of forms called a skiphos or a bell-shaped bowl. All of these are similar bowl types with mostly just geometric uh, patterns, nothing too interesting. There are some things we'll get into with some of the other vessels, but this is a particular Aegean style of bowl that is not native to the area of Turkey. This is another kind of bowl called a one handle a conical bowl. I actually, this one down here and uh, a shallow angular bowl is this. These are all Aegean style vessels. Here's a nicely preserved one that we found, which is now in the museum, and it was painted in these colors. It had a wavy line motif, which was very common to the Northern Levant during this time period at certain sites. So these are all common bowl types that were found in the area. Uh, craters, that large kind of bowl that I described before, you have much nicer motifs painted on these semicircles, stacked zigzag motif right here. Here's one of those spiral patterns with a dot filled in in the middle. And it's a blow up of some of the other uh, crater vessels you see here. Now, this is all almost all shirred material. So we, we extrapolate, uh, extrapolate the shape of the overall vessel by looking at just pot shirts and rim shirts. But because we have a lot of examples of this kind of pottery, we can, uh, we can detect the kind of vessel we're looking at just by looking at a piece of the rim if, it, uh, if we excavate that. Here's some examples of bell-shaped craters with spiral patterns here. This is a charioteer vessel called an amphoroid crater because it's a combination between an amphora, which is a, a kind of a, a flowing vessel and a crater, both with a large opening, sort of like the bowl uh, vessels that you see here on the left. Now we have amphoroid craters that tell tie not. We don't have any chariot scenes yet. So our motif repertoire is more limited, but nonetheless, it seems to indicate the presence of a foreign people that were moving in uh, at the time of the Philistines in the south. Now, this was an interesting vessel that we found. This is an amphora. This is how it looked when we first exposed it. And then we found that we had almost all the pieces that we were able to glue back together and uh, have this very fine example of a neck handled amphora, which dates to about 1125 BC. 
And this is also now in a museum in Antioch. Now, as I said before, most of the motifs we have at Tel Tainat were geometric or linear, so they're not particularly impressive uh, or unique, uh, but we have a very few pictorial uh, versions of painted pottery. We have a bird up here on the top. We have a person right here, which I'll come back to momentarily. And we have a repeating fish pattern on this large crater shirt on the, uh, on the bottom of this picture. Now here's the bird motif. I found a nice little parallel in a nearby site called Tarsus, which was the hometown of Paul. But much, much before Paul was born, the city existed and it had a vessel that or a jar that had a bird that looked just like our bird from Tel Tainat. And they dated that vessel between 1190 and 1130 BC. And it's kind of a large period of time, but that gives you a rough idea of the time period. Now we look at our anthro, we call this anthropomorphic, a person uh, indicated as opposed to a zoomorphic or an animal shape or a, a, a depiction. So this is the picture of the pot shirt in question which I just published an article on last year, uh, about a 10 or 15 page article just on this pot shirt because I call it the most important pot shirt that we've excavated from Tel Tainat amongst the thousands, if not tens of thousands of pieces of pottery overall. The reason is because I believe it's a self portrait and it indicates the people who moved into our site in the 12th century BC. So this is a drawing of that pot shirt. And as you can see, it indicates, it shows a person of some kind with some kind of arms. Um, maybe he's an alien, I'm not quite sure, but it has really long arms. It's sort of a sloppily rendered um, uh, drawing, so it's difficult to be precise about what we're looking at here. But it could be the reins uh, that he's holding to a chariot, possibly. This could be a motif here. Uh, this could be a horse's mane. I did a lot of comparisons to uh, chariot type scenes. It doesn't really fit that. There are a couple of uh, kind of unique depictions of a man standing on top of a horse, just standing upright, holding the reins of the horse, and then right behind the head and the mane, which this could be. Uh, however, those are kind of rare, so I just don't, I frankly don't know. Uh, but the main portion or feature of this uh, pot shirt and this figure is the headdress. Now, you may, you may recognize this as being somewhat similar to the earlier versions that I showed you from the Temple of Ramses III. Here's some comparisons of other pot shirts that indicate a similar kind of feathered headdress or some sort of helmet. These are charioteers from the city of Mycenae. You see them with shields and with a spear. That comes, and these are all contemporary with our pot shirt from Tel Tainat, the middle to the latter part of the 12th century BC. This figure on the left is from a beautiful ivory game box, which has a, a, a carved uh, scene on the side of it which includes this warrior with a similar kind of a headdress with a hatchet and another stick or something there in his left hand. Here are depictions of warriors from the Ramses III release that I showed you before. This figure on the lower right is also from Cyprus, just like the one on the left with game box. And it shows another warrior crouching behind his, his uh, shield with a similar kind of headdress. So this is from the island of Cyprus from the 12th century BC. Other parallels from the island of Crete. Here you have a dueling scene. Here's a shipboard scene with Marines or warriors that are shipborne, uh, also having a similar type of headdress here again. And these are from islands in the Aegean. This one I think is from the island of Kynos. So again, we have, we harken back to the area of the Aegean in ancient Greece for parallels to our potsherd from Tel Tainat. Here is, uh, in my article, I trace uh, two actual warrior graves that have been excavated from ancient Greece from the area of the Peloponnese. Remember that same area that they trace DNA to the uh, sites at Mycenae and Tiryns and Pylos. They have found a number of these warrior tombs which have uh, an accumulation of weaponry and such and even helmets like this one. It was a, this is the state they found it in when they excavated it. And it's in a somewhat of a state of ruin, but it's fairly well preserved. It was reconstructed. This is from the site of Portus uh, Kevalavriso, which is a small city in the Peloponnese. LH3C Middle describes the period of time in the middle of, or the latter part of the 12th century. When they reconstructed the helmet, 
they found that it had bronze bands that formed around the forehead, and then it had straw protruding from the top. And some of the straw was still uh, protruding here above the level of the bands, which are here reconstructed. And uh, there's actually parallels in Homer in the Trojan War, which describe uh, warriors with bronze banded helmets. So this is also contemporary with our Philistines at Tel Tainat, which I think are Philistines. And finally, these are greaves, those shin guards I showed you earlier that Goliath was wearing. They found examples of these in these warrior tombs as well. So that's a very interesting connection also to Goliath and the Philistines. Finally, when we look at the inscription, we talked about the ethnic identity of the Philistines, and it's very difficult to know because there's almost no inscriptional data that indicates their language at the time when they showed up in the 12th century, and not until many centuries later when they had assimilated, they had picked up the language of the local people, and we no longer have that indication except through names and names of gods and goddesses. But in the northern Levant, where Tel Tainan is located, we have a number of inscriptions which indicate the name of a kingdom called Palestine, which I equate to the Philistines based upon the material culture and uh, other factors that we have described in the south that we also have in the north, namely the pottery. We also have the baked loom weights that I told you was indicative of a particularly unique textile industry of the Philistines. And we have the evidence here from this temple from the city of Aleppo, in northern Syria, not very far from our site in southern Turkey, a temple to the storm god. That was the main god of the Hittites. And at the end of this temple room, you have two life-size figures carved out in stone. And the one on the left is a deity. This is the storm god. And that's indicated by the horns on his helmet. That's a, Mes a Mesopotamian style of depi depicting deity or divine status. And opposite him, you'll notice a uh, a human. He is a king, and his name is King Teta. And then there's an inscription, a long inscription, which issues from his mouth and begins here, just as if he's speaking to the god, and then it continues down along the, his backside here. And it indicates that his name is King Teta, or Taita. And the inscription begins by saying, I am King Teta, the hero, the Palestinian king, for my lord, the Halabian or Aleppo, storm god, I honored the image. So he's dedicating this temple to the storm god of Aleppo. But you'll notice here, the stone is of a different quality and hue. So uh, the excavator believes this was a later addition by King Teta to put himself into the temple opposite the storm god. But this is a very interesting inscription, and it names the kingdom called Palestine, which we believe with other inscriptions that were found where these green triangles are located, other names or other um, discoveries of inscriptions with the name King Teta or the Kingdom of Palestine within this red uh, dotted area. This would be the area of Southern Turkey and down towards uh, um, uh, Damascus in Syria. So this was about a hundred miles long. This kingdom we postulate was in existence when these people first showed up uh, probably in the 11th century coalesced as a kingdom known as Palestine. Here's another blow up in the larger map. This, the putative kingdom of Palestine in these former areas of the Hittite Empire uh, in Turkey and in northern Syria. So uh, my article about the uh, particular potsherd, I titled What's in a Face? So basically, who is this person? Who are these people? And then we can go back to the, uh, harken back to the original question of who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God. Of course, David knew who the Philistines were. His question was, who does he think he is coming up against our God, Yahweh? Yahweh's on our side. You don't stand a chance, Goliath, against me or any of the rest of us. But of course, the question we have, we don't know who the Philistines were. We have to extrapolate and determine where they originally came from in sort of modern historical terms. And the question becomes where they came from. It seems that the indications are pretty strong, if not conclusive, that they came from the area of ancient Greece, the Aegean Sea, or Western Anatolia. So to summarize, we looked at the biblical, um, some of the biblical events, the, the, the confrontation between David and Goliath, we looked at the Valley of Elon, the geography, which showed where all the Philistine pentapolis was located and all those excavated sites. 
We took a look at the material culture of the Philistines and it, where it shows they may have come from. It was unique, it was different from the Canaanite culture into which they grafted, and it seems to harken back to ancient Greece. And along with those DNA studies, both of the human remains and also the pig remains seem to point also back towards Greece. Finally, we looked at the Northern Sea Peoples, the so-called Northern Sea Peoples, uh, where the Kingdom of Palestine has been, has been identified and discovered. And I, in my book and in my uh, articles, have made the argument that these are Philistines, that the Kingdom of Palestine is Philistine. When you put all those factors together, the material culture with the pottery and the inscriptions, I believe that the coincidence of the names is too much to be beyond coincidence, that it actually is Philistines, which settle in the north at roughly the same time period as they settled in the south. This is my book. I'm going to plug it real quick called Sea Peoples of the North Levant, Aegean Style Pottery from Early Iron Age Tell Tyanot. Finally, I will conclude with that and announce our next talk, which will be first uh, Miami, we have this archaeology discipleship group on Sunday, June the 6th, where we'll talk about excavating King David and King Solomon. So we're moving down into roughly the time period of 1000 BC, when they start to coalesce as a nation with a king. And then of course, they very quickly divide into two, two kingdoms of Judah and of Israel. And I'd like to invite all of you to visit firstmiami.org slash groups to learn more about First Miami's archeology span discipleship class, class series, and also about the other church groups that we have at First Miami available online. So with that, I will conclude our talk.